Chapter 6. The Transport Layer So together with the network layer, the transport layer, and the heart of the protocol hierarchy, the network layer provides the end-to-end -end packet delivery using the datagrams and virtual circuits. The transport builds on the network layer to provide data transports from a process of a source machine to a process of a destination machine which a desired level of reliability that is independent to the physical networks currently in use. It provides the abstraction that the application needs to use on the network. Without the transport layer, the whole concept of layer protocols could be little sense. So in this chapter, you will study the transport layer in detail, including its services and choices, as well as protocols such as TCP and UDP and its performance. So the transport layer, how we say, is responsible for delivering the data across the network with its desired reliability and or quality. In other words, making sure that whatever you send over the network gets there intact. So the transport service, you got services that are provided by the upper layer, the primitives, Berkeley sockets, okay, and the internet file server. So services provided by the upper layers. The ultimate goal of the transport layer is to provide efficient, reliable, and cost-effective data transmission service to its users, normally processes in the application layer. To achieve this, the transport layer makes use of services provided by the network layer. The software and or hardware within the transport layer that does the work is called the transport entity. The transport entity can be located on the operating system's kernel and the library package bound into the network applications, in a separate user process or even on the network interface card. The first two options are the most common on the internet. You may actually see this figure that you're watching right now on page 496 on your book. Okay, so there are two types of network service, connection-oriented and connection-less. There are two types of transport service. The connection-oriented transport service is similar to the connection-oriented network service in many and release. Okay, you can also find, for example, the different um, the how the segments are actually sent over in packets or in frames over the transport layer on page 499 on figure 6-3 it actually gives you an example where you got the header the packet header the frame header and then you got the segment header all together where in this example for example you have the segments that are containing packets and in turn, these packets are contained into frames. And when a frame arrives, the data link layer process that frame header and its destination address matches the local delivery that passes the contents of the frame payload field up to the network entity. The network entity similarly processes the packet header and then passes the contents of the packet payload up the transport entity. This nesting is actually illustrated in this figure that you're seeing and can also be found in the book as, may, as I mentioned earlier. Transfer protocols. The transfer service is implemented by a transfer protocol used between the two transport entities. In some ways, transfer protocols resemble the data link protocols that, we, that were studied actually in Chapter 3. Both have to deal with an error control sequencing and flow control among the other issues. Okay? However, significant differences between the two are also exist. And we're going to go over some of them here in a few minutes. Addressing. When an application process wishes to set up a connection to a remote application process, it must specify which one to connect to. Connectionless transfer has the same problem to whom each message may be sent. The method normally uses to define transport addresses to which pro processes can be listened to connection requests. In the internet, these endpoints are actually called ports. 
which will use generic terms as transport service access point to mean specific endpoint in the transport layer. The analogous endpoints in the network layer are not surprisingly called NSAPs, Network Service Access Points, and IP addresses are example of NASAPs. And you can actually see this example on page four, 509 where it illustrates the relationship between the NSAP and the TSAP. Connection establishment. Establishing a connection sounds easy, but it is actually very tricky. At first glance, it would seem sufficient for one trans one transport entity to just send a connection request segment to the destination and wait for the connection accepted reply. The problem occurs when the network can lose, delay, corrupt, and duplicate the packets. This behavior causes some serious complications. Imagine a network that is so congested that acknowledgments hardly ever get back in time and each packet times out and then retransmitted two or three times. Suppose that the network uses diagrams inside that every packet follows a different route. Some of the packets might get stuck in traffic, jam inside the network and then take a long time to arrive. That is, they may be delayed in the network and then pop out much later when the sender thought that they had been lost. The worst possible nightmare as it follows, a user establishes a connection with a bank, sends the message telling the bank to transfer a large amount of money to the account of a not entirely trustworthy person. Unfortunately, the packets decide to take the scenic route to the destination and go off exploring to the remote corner to the network. The sender then times out and sends them all again. This time, the packets take the shortest route and then deliver quickly to the sender releases to connection. Unfortunately, eventually the initial batch of packets finally come out of the hidden and arrive at the destination in order, asking the bank to establish a new connection and transfer money again. The bank has no way of telling that these are actually duplicates. It must assume that this is a second independent transaction and transfers the money again and again and again. So the key problem is to ensure the reliability even though packets may be lost, corrupted, delayed, or duplicated. The approach is to do not reuse the sequence numbers and three-way handshake for establishing the connection. The MSL of two minutes is just an engineering bound that is conservative. Twice the MSL is used to ensure that neither a packet or an acknowledgement of the packet can still be in the network. When a connection is set up, any lower order K bits of blocks are used in the KB initial sequence. Though, unlike other protocols, each connection starts numbering its segments with a different initial sequence number. The sequence space should be so large that by the time the sequence numbers wrap around all segments in the same sequence number along one. This linear relation between time and initial sequence numbers is shown in this image that can also be found on page 514. The forbidden region shows the times of the which segment sequence numbers are illegal leading up to their use. If any segment is sent with a sequence number in this region, it could be delayed and impersonate a different packet with the same sequence number that will be issued slightly later. So for example, if the host crashes and it restarts at time 70 seconds, it will be initial sequence numbers based on the clock to pick up after it left off. The host does not start with a lower sequence number for the forbidden region. So, for example, in TCP, this, the sequence number used to detect in duplicates is threatened in a combination of a timestamp of 32-bit sequence number. It won't wrap within 2 ml cell. 4 minutes satisfying the left side and it will rise fast enough avoiding the problem on the right-hand side. The three-way hand check is used for initial packets. For the initial packet weekend, 
We can tell if it's a duplicate by looking to see if the sequence number has already been received without remembering state across connections and we don't want to do that. A three-way handshake is used instead having both hosts contribute fresh sequence numbers x and y is the key. So to solve the specific problems, in 1975 Tom Linson introduced the three-way handshake. The establishment protocol involves a one-peer checking with all other than the connection requesting the current. The normal setup procedure when host 1 indicates as shown in this figure, host 1 chooses a sequence number X and sends a connection segment containing to it host 2. Host 2 replies with an ACK segment acknowledging X and announcing its own initial sequence number Y. Finally, host 1 acknowledges host 2 choice of initial sec sequence number in the first data segment and then it sends it off. Then, now let us see how the three-way handshake works in the presence of delayed duplicate segments. <clears throat> so, the first segment is delayed duplicate connection request from an old connection. This segment arrives at host 2 without host 1 knowledge. Host 2 reacts to this segment by sending the host 1 an ACK segment, in effect asking for verification that host 1 was indeed trying to set up a new connection. When host 1 rejects host 2 attempt to establish a connection, host 2 realizes that it was trickled and by, and by a delayed duplicate and abandons the connection. In this way, delayed duplicate does not damage. The worst case is when both delayed connection request an ACK and are floating around the submit. This case is shown in this on the figure C. As in the previous example, host 2 gets a delayed connection request and replies to it. At this point, it is crucial to realize that host 2 has proposed using a Y in the, in the in initial sequence number of host 2 to host 1 traffic, knowing full that there are no segments containing sequence number Y in acknowledgments to Y are still existence. When the second delay segment arrives at host 2 and the fact that Z has been acknowledged, rather than Y tells host 2 that this 2 is an old duplicate, the important thing to realize here is that there is no combination of old segments that can cause the protocol to fail and have connections set up by accident when no one wants it. TCP uses this three-way handshake to establish connections. Within a connection, a timestamp is used to extend the 32-bit sequence number so that it, would, it will not wrap within the maximum packet lifetime. Even for gigabit per second connections, the mechanism to fix TCP was needed and it was used to faster and faster links. It is described that the RFC 1323, which was called the protection against wrap sequence numbers across connections for the initial sequence numbers and before the pulse came to into play, TCP originally used the clock-based scheme just that was described. We have then we have the connection release. Releasing a connection is easier than establishing one. Nevertheless, there are two more pitfalls than you might think. As we mentioned earlier, there are two styles of determining the connection: asymmetric release and symmetric release. Asymmetric release is the way the telephone system works. When one party hangs up, the connection is broken. Symmetric release threads the connection as two separate undirectional connections and requires each one to be released separately. Asymmetric release is upright and may result in data loss. Consider the scenario as seen in this diagram here and also page 518. After the connection is established, host 1 sends a segment that arrives properly at host 2. Then host 1 sends another segment. Unfortunately, host 2 issues a disconnect before 
the segment arrives. The result is that the connection is released and the data is lost. Clearly, a more sophisticated release protocol is needed to avoid data loss. One way is to use a symmetric release, in which each direction is released independently at each other. Here, a host can continue to receive data even after it has sent a disconnect segment. Symmetric release does the job when each process has a fixed amount of data sent and clearly knows when it has, was, has sent it. In other situations, determining that all the work has been done and the connection should be, should be terminated is not so obvious. One can envision a protocol in which host 1 says, I'm done, are you done too? If host 2 responds, I am done too, goodbye, the connection can be safely released. Unfortunately, this protocol does not always work. There is a famous problem that illustrates this issue. It's called the two army problem. Imagine that a white army is encamped in a valley as shown in this figure. On both of the surrounding hillsides are blue armies. The, army, the white army is larger than than either of the blue armies alone, but together the blue armies are larger than the white army. If either blue army attacks itself, it will be defeated, but if the two blue armies attack, either blue army attacks by itself, but if the two armies attack simultaneously, they will be victorious. The blue armies want to synchronize their attacks, however, their only communication medium is to send messages on foot down the valley, where they may be captured, and if the message is lost, they have to use unreliable communication channel. The question is, does the protocol exist that allows the blue armies to win? So here, for example, you have different types of connection releases, as we actually discussed earlier. You may look into more details on this, actually, on page 521. But for example, in this one, they're actually telling you where you can actually avoid such problems that we would have seen, for example, with the army and how some of the data can be lost by using these types of actually this, um, connections where you need to have an agreement in pushing the problem back to the transport user and letting each side independently decide when it is going to be done. As actually between host 1 and host 2, you can tell here how it actually is working. Okay, here's another example as well, wherever the case is handled within the timer and the retransmission as well. <clears throat> And of course, there are wireless issues. Transfer protocols such as TCP that implement congestion control should be independent of the underlying network and the link layer technologies. That is good theory, but in practice, there are issues with the wireless networks. The main issue with that packet loss is often used in a congestion signal that includes TCP as discussed. Okay? Wireless networks lose packets all the time due to transmission errors. Page 540 on your book, and as shown here, it shows the path with a wire and wireless link to which the masking strategy, strategy is used. There are two, two aspects to note. First, the sender does not necessarily know that the path includes a wireless link, since all it sees is the wire link to which it is attached. Internet paths are heterogeneous. And there is no general method for the sender to tell what kind of links compromise the path. This complicates the congestion control problem, and there is no easy way to use the protocol for wireless links and another protocol for wire links. The second aspect is a puzzle. It shows the two mechanisms that are driven by loss. Link layer frame retransmissions the transport layer congestion control. The puzzle is how these two mechanisms can coexist without getting confused. After all, 
A loss should cause one mechanism to take action because it is either a transmission. So here we got internet protocols, UDP, RPC, and then real time. <clears throat> So the internet has two main protocols in the third layer, connectionless protocol and connection to one. The protocols complement each other. The connectionless protocol is a UDP. It has almost nothing beyond sending by between applications. And then the connection oriented is the TCP. Okay. So UDP is actually the, the protocol that suite supports a connectionless transfer protocol, which is called the user datagram protocol. UDP provides a way for applications to send encapsulated IP datagrams without having to establish a connection. It's actually described in RFC 768, and it transmits segments that consist of 8-byte headers followed by the payload. And you can see in this figure right here, we got two ports that serve to identify the endpoints within the source and the destination machines. When a UDP packet arrives, its payload is handed to the process attached to the destination port. This attachment occurs when the bind primitive emulator is used, as seen in this figure for TCP. Think of port mailboxes that applications can be run to receive packets. We still have more to say about them when we describe TCP, which is also the user's ports. In fact, the main value of UDP over just using the raw IP is the addition of the source and the destination ports. Without the port fields, the transport layer would not know what to do with each incoming packet with them and delivers the embedded segments to the correct application. The remote procedure call connects applications over the network with the familiar abstraction and procedure calls. Okay, so basically what it is is that it actually is known as it has and it has is the key work in the area where in if I actually was invented by Burry Nelson in 1984. The NAT show what Barry Nelson suggested was allowing programs to call procedures located on remote host. So when a process on machine 1 calls for a procedure on machine 2, the calling process of 1 is suspended and the execution of call procedure 2 takes place. Information can be transported from the caller to the, to the callee and the parameters can both come back to the procedure result, which is known as RPC remote procedure call. And on page 549, you actually see the same figure right here. And this is where they actually explain, for example, step one is the client calling the client stuff. Step two is the client stuff packing the parameters into the message and making the system call. And then step three is the operating system sending the message from the client to the server. And step four, the operating system passing the incoming packet to the server hub. And then finally, Step five is the server system, is the server stuff telling the pr server procedure for the unmatched parameters. Next, we got the TCP protocols that we're going to be looking at very briefly here. Okay, so for example, you have the different types of models here. You got the TCP provides applications with reliable byte system procedures and its workhorse over the internet some popular ones that you actually look at and you and i do actually suggest that you actually know this ones and know the port numbers because chances are is that you are actually be using them quite heavily okay you got ftp ssh smtp http pop imap https rtsp and ipp okay it is very important, especially if you are actually a um, network administrator, that you look into detail on this because sometimes you might be asked to block or open certain ports and you need to know which ones and what they do and how to do it. 
So the TCP model, how is it and what happens, okay? So the TCP connection is a byte stream. It's not a message stream, okay? Very important on that. If you look on page 555, you will notice that the same diagram that we're actually looking at right now, it is actually described on, um, on the book as well, okay? So for example, if the sending process does four 512 byte writes to a TCP stream, this data may be delivered to the receiving process as a 512 byte chunks, two 10 24 byte chunks, one 20 okay, as shown in this figure. Or some other way, there is no way for the receiver to detect the units in which the data was written, no matter how hard it tries. So the TCP segment header. TCP segment header includes the addressing, the ports, the sliding window, the flowchart, and the error control. The flags say what kind of a segment it is. Okay, so for a connection establishment segment, the ACK number is a cumulative acknowledgement that means that all data up to the number has been received after they fix parking company options. So the connection establishment, so how does it actually work? One slight difference from before is the receiver echoes the ACK plus one rather than simply ACK to show that it received and understood the connection request. Okay, connection request is an SYN for synchronize. Disconnect request is a FIN for finish. Very important on that. Some of the modelings, okay. And again, you may also review this more into more into detail, okay. If you would like, on your book, actually, on page 561 and 563 where it actually gives you more details about all the models and how they actually work. Performance issues, of course, there's always problems with everything, right? Life could not be ongoing without any problems. Unexpected loads often interact with protocols to cause performance problems. So need to find the situations and improve the protocol. Some examples, you can have a broadcast storm. By now, you should know what that is. A synchronization, a building of computers all contacting the DHCP server together and after a power failure, and then tiny packets, which sometimes situations can cause the TCP to send many small packets instead of a few large ones, and that, of course, takes time. Measuring your network performance, okay? It is the key to understanding performance, okay? For example, you need to know how much your network can handle, okay? Caching, fetching web pages will give you surprising fast results that they are unexpected cache. Clocks may over underestimate the fast events and there will be some competing workloads. So again, the more you know your network and the more you know how to improve it, the better it's going to work. Host design, host design for fast networks. Poor host software can greatly slow down networks. The rules of thumbs. Host the speed more important than the network speed. Reduce the packet count. Minimize the data touching. Minimize the context switches. Avoid congestion and avoid timeouts. This is very important. And if you are the network administrator or the network engineer for your business, you should know how to do this because the more you actually keep track of your network and the more you maintenance your network, the better healthier it's going to be. Then we move into seg fast segment processing. Okay, Fast segment processing was actually um, invented in 2001 and 1989. Okay. And if you want to look at this figure, it's actually on page 591, where you can look more into the details of how this actually works. And it's the fast path from the sender to the receiver that is shown with a heavy line. This processing step on this path is actually shared, okay? And of course, so for example, you got step one, which is locating the connection record from the incoming sector segment for step two. Then you got the connection record can be stored in the hash table for which the one simple function of the two IP addresses and then the two ports is the key. Once the connection record has been located, both addresses can both 
reports must be compared to verify that the current record has been found. Okay, so here's for example as well again, in more the header fields are often the same from packet to the next FRA flow and then the copy check that happens in between them to make sure that it is the correct one. Header compression, the overhead can be very large for small packets. 40 bytes of the header for the RTP, UDP, IP, or voice over IP packet. And then you've got the compression, which runs between the link and the network layer, and then omits the field that don't change or change predictively. So protocols for long, fat networks. Long, fat means big networks. It requires protocols with ample buffering, a few RGs, rather than reducing the bits of the wire. So for example, you can see here starting to send one megabit from San Diego to Boston 20 milliseconds later after the start, 40 second milliseconds after the start is one to the other. Protocol you can buy more bandwidth but not lower delay. You need to shift the ends to lower further. Okay, So you have to make sure that you're actually increasing and traveling at a good distance. Delay the tolerant. Delay tolerant networks store messages inside the network until they can be delivered. It's kind of like a cache mode area. So the architecture is the messages that are called bundles are stored in the DTN nodes while waiting for the intermediate link to become a contact. Bundles may wait hours, not milliseconds in routers, but may not work, but may be no working end to end path at any time. So the advantage of using the DTN here versus the traditional wireless network is that there may not be working paths sometimes. So satellite, satellite has no contact ground station. On the path might not exist for long enough to send by any, but satellite software would still send the images without worrying about these issues even if the network stores them. Storing bundles at a ground stations also decoups the satellite link from the ground backlog hall. If the wireless is faster, then the images may be stored in the ground station. So the bundle protocol. Okay, so why the converged layer? We want to define just one bundle protocol to run over TCP over the transport layers. The transport protocols are not going to have the exactly the same interfaces, so they will not fit exactly with the bundle protocol. Convergence layers in the glue and join interfaces together. Okay, so here's an example where you get the destination of the source that adds the high level addresses, then the cost that it transfers the ship's delivery responsibility, and the dictionary provides the compression efficiency as shown in this image right here. Okay, and like I said, we went over some of the pieces of the chapter, but you still have to make sure that you read the book before you actually go through all of the um, the questions and the lessons that you have to learn in this in chapter six okay if you have any questions again feel free to send an email to your instructor thank you